The cerebrum has gray and white matter. The gray matter, which is other layer of the cerebrum, also called as the cortex, is classified according to surface anatomy. Basically, the frontal lobe is located in front of the central sulcus. The occipital lobe is located behind an imaginary line drawn between the preoccipital notch and the top of the parietal occipital sulcus. The parietal lobe is located between the frontal and occipital lobes. The temporal lobe is the inferior part of the cerebrum. The border between the parietal and temporal lobes is an imaginary line that courses from the end of the sylvian fissure to this imaginary line. The white matter of the cerebrum, which underlies the gray matter and intervenes between cortical gray matter and the basal ganglia, contains three types of fibers. The association fibers connect the different regions in the same hemisphere. The projection fibers, such as corona radiata, connect the cortex with caudal parts of the brain and spinal cord. The commissural fibers, such as corpus callosum, connect the two hemispheres across the median plane. Let's start from the association fibers, which has the short and long types. The short fibers, also called as U fibers, are located superficially, just underlying the cortical gray matter, and the long fibers are located at deeper position. The arcuate fasciculus is the frontal parietal temporal long association fibers that connects the Wernicke's area, which consists of the middle and posterior parts of the superior and middle temporal gyri, to Broca's area, located in the posterior two-thirds of the inferior frontal gyrus. This DTI demonstrates that the arcade fasciculus terminates in the precentral gyrus as well as Broca's area, which is composed of the parsoparcularis and triangularis in the inferior frontal gyrus. The arcade fasciculus is subdivided into a ventral part, which is blue one, and a dorsal part, which is orange one. In the supracilian area, the main long association fiber pathway is the superior longitudinal fasciculus, which has three parts. SLF1, dorsal pathway, SLF2, middle pathway, and SLF3, ventral pathway. The SLF1 is positioned within the superior frontal gyrus, the SLF2 within the middle frontal gyrus, and SLF3 within the inferior frontal gyrus. The SLF1 lies within the superior bank of the cingulate sulcus and travels just above the cingulum to connect the superior parietal lobe and anterior cingulate cortex. The SLF2 extends from the inferior parietal lobe to the middle frontal gyrus. The SLF3 courses within the frontal parietal operculum and extends from the inferior parietal lobe to the inferior frontal gyrus. The SLF is considered as a higher-order multisensory associative system. The compartments of the superior longitudinal fasciculus and arcuate fasciculus can be seen on this DTI. SLF1, turquoise, is the dorsal pathway. SLF2, clear red, is the middle pathway. And SLF3, yellow, is the ventral pathway in the supracilian area. The ventral, blue, and dorsal orange segments of the arcade fasciculus can be seen. Other long association fiber pathways are the inferior front occipital fasciculus, which is a front occipital connection, the inferior longitudinal fasciculus, which is a temporal occipital connection, and the uncinate fasciculus, which is a frontotemporal connection. We are looking from above. The function of the uncinate fasciculus is to link emotion and cognition as a ventral limbic pathway in contrast to the single or dorsal limbic pathway. Additionally, some research shows that the uncinate fasciculus is involved in semantic processing of language, auditory working memory, and sound recognition. Language processing has a ventral semantic stream and a dorsal phonological stream that connect Broca's area and Wernicke's area. Within the dorsal stream, frontoparietal temporal regions are proposed as being involved in mapping auditory speech sounds to articulatory representations. The major pathway is arcuate fasciculus. In contrast, the ventral stream is proposed to be involved in mapping auditory speech sounds to meaning. 
The major fiber pathway in the ventral stream is the inferior frontal occipital fasciculus. Other fiber pathways are the external capsule, oncinate fasciculus, inferior longitudinal fasciculus, and middle longitudinal fasciculus. The mesh to the inferior frontal occipital fasciculus produces the semantic prefigia in the dominant hemisphere. Visual processing has two pathways like language processing. Visual information follows two main streams from the occipital lobe. The ventral stream, which is what pathway, travels to the temporal lobe by means of the inferior longitudinal fasciculus and relates to object identification and recognition. The dorsal stream, which is wire pathway, travels to the parietal lobe, which is the navigation center of the cerebrum, by means of the occipital short association fibers and the part of SLF2, and relates to processing location of object in space. The corpus callosum is the major endomospheric commissural pathway that connects most neocortical areas. The callosal fibers emanating from cortical areas in one hemisphere gather above the lateral ventricle and enter the corpus callosum to reach the other hemisphere. They cross the midline by passing below the cingulum to form the roof of the lateral ventricle. The callosal fibers arising from the genu of the corpus callosum turn in an anterior oblique direction to interconnect the frontal regions where they are called to forceps minor. At the level of the splenium, fibers turn in a posterior oblique direction to interconnect the paradoxipedal regions where they are called to forceps major. The callosal fibers arising from the splenium, named the tapetal fibers, sweep downward to form the roof and lateral wall of the atrium, temporal and occipital horns of the lateral ventricle. Other commissural pathways are the anterior and posterior commissures which traverse the midline. The anterior commissure resembles bicycle handlebars located immediately in front of the columns of the fornix and plays a role in visual processing together with the splenium of the corpus callosum. The anterior commissure may compensate for congenitally absent corpus callosum by integrating in the hemispheric visual information. The mammillary bodies and the floor of the third ventricle can be seen here. The posterior commissure is located on the dorsal aspect of the upper end of the cerebral aqueduct. The anterior and posterior commissures can be seen in this medial view. The posterior commissure originates from its nucleus located in front of the oculomotor nucleus. The posterior commissure continues downward into the medial longitudinal fasciculus. The posterior commissure is involved in popular light reflex. The anterior commissure crosses the midline at the base of the putamen to connect the orbital frontal, occipital, and temporal lobes, especially amygdala. It has an anterior cruise that extends forward and a posterior cruise that extends laterally. The posterior cruise is divided into temporal and occipital extensions. From clinical perspective, it was suggested that seizure activity can propagate to the contralateral medial temporal lobe by way of the anterior commissure. So its cutting is a part of the hemispherectomy procedure for control of intractable seizures. After looking at the association and commissural fiber pathways, let's move on to the projection fiber pathways. The front of parietal projection fibers, which have a vertical direction, can be called as the corona radiata, and the occipital projection fibers, which have a horizontal direction, can be called as sagittal stratum. The corona radiata is formed by the external and internal capsules above the upper level of the putamen. The centrum semiovale is located above the level of the corpus callosum and consists of the superior longitudinal fasciculus association fibers, corona radiata projection fibers, and callosal commissural fibers. 
We have seen all three types of fiber pathways of the cerebrum. Now we are going to look at all these fiber pathways from the lateral to medial direction in a stepwise manner as well as the central core and limbic system. Functionally, the frontal lobe is the conscious and thought center, the parietal lobe is navigation center, the occipital lobe is the vision center, and the temporal lobe is the memory and sound center of the cerebrum. The removal of the gray matter exposes the short association fibers which interconnect knee body gyri. The removal of the short association fibers exposes the long association fibers at a deeper position. The most superficial long association fibers are the superior longitudinal fasciculus, which connects the frontal and parietal lobes, and the arcuate fasciculus, which connects the frontal and the temporal lobes. The removal of the arcuate fasciculus exposes the middle longitudinal fasciculus and inferior longitudinal fasciculus. The middle longitudinal fasciculus lies within the superior temporal gyrus and the inferior longitudinal fasciculus lies within the inferior temporal gyrus. The middle longitudinal fasciculus connects the temporal pole to the inferior parietal lobe, especially the angular gyrus. The middle longitudinal fasciculus is involved in location of sound in space. The inferior longitudinal fasciculus connects the temporal pole to the dorsolateral occipital lobe without reaching the visual cortex. In this dissection, the frontal parietal operculum has been removed to expose the insula. The central insular sulcus curses almost parallel with the central sulcus on the convexity and divides the insular cortex into short and long insular gyri. The short insular gyri are located anterior to the central insular sulcus and the long insular gyri are located posterior to the central insular sulcus. The insula is encircled by the limiting sulci, which are the superior, inferior and anterior limiting sulci. The junction of the anterior and superior limiting sulci is called the anterior insular point and the junction of the superior and inferior limiting sulci is called the posterior insular point. These points and limiting sulci are important during insular surgery. An axial plane, we are looking at the central core area located between the insular cortex laterally and the ventricles medially. The central core includes the extreme capsule, claustrum, external capsule, putamen, globus pallidus, carate nucleus, internal capsule, and thalamus. The insular cortex, extreme capsule, claustrum, external capsule, putamen, globus pallidus, and internal capsule are positioned in the central core from the lateral to medial. After removal of the insular cortex, we can see the extreme capsule, which is composed of the short association fibers providing the connections among the insular gyri and the operculi. The function of the extreme capsule is not clear, but it has been suggested as a part of the semantic language stream. In further dissection, the external capsule and claustrum were exposed by removing the extreme capsule. The claustrum and external capsule can be divided into dorsal and ventral parts. The dorsal claustrum is here and the dorsal external capsule, which is formed by cluster cortical fibers, is here. The ventral claustrum splits out into the ventral external capsule at the limit insula to reach the amygdala. The cluster cortical fibers, which is the dorsal external capsule, course from the dorsal claustrum to the cortex between the supplementary motor area anteriorly and the parietal lobe posteriorly. The cluster cortical system has been related to the integration of visual, somatosensory, and motor informations. Just medial to the external capsule is the putamen. The putamen is one of the basal ganglia structures. Its main function is to regulate movements and learning. Another basal ganglia structure is the globus pallidus, which is located just medial to the putamen. 
In this picture, the posterior half of the putamen has been removed to expose the globus pallidus and internal capsule. The external and internal capsule come together to form the corona radiata above the putamen. A coronal section, what we can see here is that the external and internal capsules come together above the putamen to form the corona radiata. Also, the globus pallidus is situated medial to the putamen. The ventral external capsule is formed by the inferior front occipital fasciculus above and the uncinate fasciculus below at the limb insula. The inferior front occipital fasciculus courses between the frontal and occipital lobes. The uncinate fasciculus connects the orbital frontal area to the temporal pole, forming a hook shape. Removal of the putamen and inferior front occipital fasciculus exposes the entire globus pallidus and anterior commissure. The globus pallidus sits just behind the anterior commissure and plays in the regulation of voluntary movements. The procedure known as pallidotomy is used to treat some movement disorders. The anterior commissure courses below the ventral aspect of the anterior limb of the internal capsule. In the hemisphere, it moves caudally and passes laterally through the ventral aspect of the globus pallidus in the grotelia canal. It courses downwards to the temporal pole just behind the uncinate fasciculus. Enlarged view of previous slide. The anterior limb, geno, and posterior limb of the internal capsule are observed. The substantia nominata is located in front and beneath the anterior commissure. Here is the ventral claustrum, separates out in the uncinate fasciculus to reach the amygdala. An axial section. The anterior limb of the internal capsule is located between the head of caudate nucleus and the lentiform nucleus, which is composed of the putamen and globus pallidus. The posterior limb of the internal capsule is located between the lentiform nucleus and thalamus. The geno is the junction of the anterior and posterior limbs. A superior lateral view. The geno is located just behind the anterior commissure at the same coronal level as the foramen of Monroe and posterior short insular gyrus. The removal of the anterior limb of the internal capsule exposes the head of the caudate nucleus. Here is a ventral claustrum which speeds out into the uncinate fasciculus to reach the amygdala. The uncinate fasciculus is a frontotemporal long association fiber pathway. The uncinate fasciculus has a dorsolateral part which goes to the orbital frontal area and a ventromedial part which goes to the septal area from the temporal pole. Clinically, some detailed studies in patients with schizophrenia have found morphometric changes in the uncinate fasciculus. At the same time, disruption of the uncinate fasciculus during the anteromedial temporal lobectomy may be associated with psychosocial clinical improvement because the uncinate fasciculus can no longer convey the pathological information from the temporal lobe to the orbital frontal cortex which is involved in decision making. We are looking from above. The dorsolateral part of the uncinate fasciculus, which projects to the lateral orbital frontal area, and the ventromedial part, which projects to the septal and medial orbital frontal areas, can be seen. The caudate nucleus is an arched C shaped structure with head, body, and tail parts. It also forms the lateral wall of the lateral ventricle. We are looking from above. The caudate nucleus surrounds the lateral part of the thalamus and the straight terminalis travels between the caudate nucleus and thalamus. After removal of the thalamus, we can see the position of the caudate nucleus in relation to the insular limiting sulci. The head of the caudate nucleus is positioned inside the insular area which is surrounded by the limiting sulci. The anterior insular point is positioned above the head of the caudate nucleus. The body of the caudate nucleus sits above the superior limiting sulcus and passes just deep to the posterior insular point. 
Below the posterior inferior point, it's called the tail of the caudate nucleus, and it travels behind the inferior limiting sulcus. The tail of the caudate nucleus crosses the inferior limiting sulcus before blending into the amygdala. Among the basal ganglia structures, we have addressed the putamen, globus pallidus, and the caudate nucleus. Now we are going to look at the rest of the basal ganglia structures. We are looking from above. The nucleus accumbens is located underneath the head of the caudate nucleus. The subthalamic nucleus is located ventrolateral to the red nucleus in the diencephalon. Posterior view of the diencephalic area. The subthalamic nucleus is positioned ventrolateral to the red nucleus and dorsomedial to the internal capsule. Lateral view. The substantia nigra is positioned on the ventral surface of the subthalamic nucleus. The red nucleus is here. The basal ganglia structures has connections with cerebral cortex and brainstem. Let's see the projection fibers and their relationship with the lateral ventricle. Basically, the fronda parietal projection fibers can be called as the corona radiata and the occipital projection fibers can be called as the sagittal stratum. The corona radiata fibers run medial to the superior longitudinal fasciculus. The sagittal stratum fibers run medial to the inferior front occipital fasciculus, inferior longitudinal fasciculus, and occipital extension of the anterior commissure. Removal of the inferior front occipital fasciculus and occipital extension of the anterior commissure exposes the sagittal stratum. The sagittal stratum is composed of the occipital pontine fibers and occipital thalamic fibers, which is also called as the optic radiations. The optic radiation fibers arise from the lateral geniculate body and travel in the roof and lateral wall of the temporal horn and then lateral to the atrium to reach the calcarine sulcus. Notable, the upper one third of the atrium is free from the optic radiation fibers. The optic radiations are separated from the temporal horn and atrium of the lateral ventricle by the tapetum. The atrium and occipital horn of the lateral ventricle are covered laterally by the sagittal stratum and tapetal fibers and medially by the forceps major. In the medial wall of the atrium, we see the bulb of the corpus callosum overlying the fibers of the forceps major and the, the calcar avus overlying the deep end of the calcarine sulcus. The anterior bundle of the optic radiations are called the Mayer's loop and it extends up to the tip of the temporal horn. The amygdala forms the anterior wall of the temporal horn. The hippocampus is located in the floor of the temporal horn. Removal of the thalamus exposes the third ventricle. The stria terminalis arises from the septal area, which is located around the anterior commissure in the midline, and wraps around the thalamus to blend into the amygdala. The stria medullaris thalami extends from the septal area to the habenula. Let's take a look at the subcortical white middle anatomy of the frontal lobe. The lateral surface of the frontal lobe is bordered posteriorly by the central sulcus and superiorly by the superior hemispheric border. The lower border of the lateral surface of the frontal lobe has an anterior part that faces the orbital roof and a posterior part, the suvian border, that faces the temporal lobe across the suvian fissure. The subcortical white middle organization of the frontal lobe includes the projection, commissural, short and long association fiber pathways. The superior longitudinal fasciculus 2 is situated within the middle frontal gyrus. Medial to the superior longitudinal fasciculus 2 are the corona radiata containing the frontal projection fibers. In fiber dissection, the colossal fibers at the level of the superior frontal gyrus, the frontal horn and body of the lateral ventricle, as well as the insular area at the level of the middle and inferior frontal gyri have been exposed. Here is the anterior insular point which is an important landmark for surgery. 
The ependymal layer of the ventricle was opened. The anterior insular point corresponds to the frontal horn of the lateral ventricle. The cingulum, which is a part of the limbic system, runs medial to the colossal fibers. A similar dissection in another specimen. The relationship between the colossal fibers and cingulum can be seen. The removal of the centrum semi exposes the contralateral frontal lobe. The further dissection of the central chorea exposes the inferior frontal occipital fasciculus and putamen. After seeing the frontal lobe, let's take a look at the internal anatomy of the temporal lobe in order from the lateral to medial. The temporal cortex and short association fibers was removed to expose the long association fibers. The both middle and inferior longitudinal fasciculi originates from the temporal pole. The middle longitudinal fasciculus courses within the superior temporal gyrus, while the inferior longitudinal fasciculus courses within the inferior temporal gyrus. Fire dissection, the position of the uncinate fasciculus and inferior frontal occipital fasciculus can be seen here. The removal of the uncinate fasciculus inferior frontal occipital fasciculus and extensions of the anterior commissure exposes the optic radiation fibers which arise from the lateral geniculate body and pass medial to the inferior limiting sulcus to form the roof and lateral wall of the temporal horn of the lateral ventricle. After arising in the lateral geniculate body, the optic radiation fibers pass between the inferior limiting sulcus and tail of the caudate nucleus to cover the roof and lateral wall of the temporal horn. Finally, let's look at the limbic system. The limbic system is a group of interconnected cortical and subcortical areas that links visceral states and emotion to cognition and behavior. The limbic cortex is composed of the parahippocampal gyrus, hippocampal formation, which is hidden, and cingulate gyrus. The parahippocampal gyrus is an elongated C-shaped gyrus between the uncus and isthmus of the cingulate gyrus where the lingual gyrus merges into it. Laterally, the collateral sulcus separates it from the fusiform gyrus. This gyrus forms a hook-like expansion anteriorly called the uncus. The parahippocampus and uncus lie laterally and envelop the hippocampus. The hippocampus plays a role in memory function. The perihippocampal gyrus is important for nursing, behavior, and attention. The cingulum is a long association fiber pathway which interconnects the perihippocampal and cingulate gyri. Medial wave, the subcortical area of the limbic system basically includes the olfactory system, septal region, hypothalamus, and amygdala. The best known limbic pathway that interconnects the limbic cortical and subcortical areas is Papi's circuit. To reveal, fibers leave the hippocampal formation and proceed through the phonics to reach the mammillary body. From here, a new pathway, the mammillotelomic tract, ascends up to the anterior telomic nucleus. The information in the anterior telomic nucleus continues to the cingulate gyrus by means of the telomic cingulate fibers which pass through the internal capsule. From the cingulate gyrus, the information carries to the parahippocampal gyrus by the cingulum. The parahippocampal gyrus projects to the hippocampal formation, hence the circuit is formed.